I am a medical doctor and cancer researcher. This is my second teaching video. I'm recording this in 2024. The first video was about Kaplan-Meier curves and you gave me very nice feedback. This is why we're now doing a second one. I had one negative feedback. The video was too long. So this one will be shorter. And I had one question, what is PFS? So this one will be about PFS. This first introduction is just to encourage you to write more comments. I will cut the introduction eventually out to make the video even shorter. PFS stands for progression-free survival. If you are a cancer patient, please know your own PFS is not a relevant information to guide your treatment. How you feel lab values imaging serve that purpose. What PFS is good for is to understand the outcome of other patients. It is an endpoint for clinical oncology trials and describes how well a group of cancer patients did when treated in a certain way. PFS is often expressed as one year progression free survival rate. And then it says how many patients were free of cancer progression after one year of treatment. PFS is only one of several ways to do that. OS, overall survival, is a famous alternative. Combining the outcome of several individual patients, aggregating the data, is done using the Kaplan-Meier estimate and the previous video showed the basics. This time, we focus on the differences between various time to event endpoints. PFS, progression-free survival, what is that? In this video, we will go over the FDA guidance for clinical trial endpoints, describe an individual patient journey and show how the different endpoints reflect in that. To find the guidance, you Google, you type in something like that, and you click on it, you will come to this. There is a place to download a document. You can download the document. Please note, it is written 2018. Things have changed since. The document is still very relevant. In there, you can see the different time to event endpoints. It goes over overall survival, disease-free survival, event-free survival, time to progression, progression-free survival, and time to treatment failure. Those are time to event endpoints. They're not the only endpoints of clinical trials. There is response, there is duration of response, which doesn't come up in that document, but I'm gonna go over it in a minute. There is safety, patient-reported outcome, biomarkers, pharmacokinetic, and or even money. Please note, this document also mentions definitions may vary among studies, which means when you write a clinical protocol as a drug development researcher, you have some freedom. It also means if you read the results of clinical trials, you better know how the definition was there in the protocol, because it may not be precisely as in the FDA document. Let's come to our patient journey. This is the story of a 50-year-old female patient. She had cancer that recurred, had multiple lines of treatment. This is what happened with the tumor of this lady. Before starting the drug, the tumor grew. That's what tumors do. Then our investigator started the drug. The tumor was the same in the beginning. Then it seemed to be a little bigger. Now, this happens. It may be an artifact of imaging. Imaging is not 100% precise, or it could actually reflect that the volume of the tumor is indeed slightly bigger, but it does not necessarily mean that there are more tumor cells making the tumor bigger. It could be that inflammatory cells have infiltrated the tumor. Those also have volume and make it look bigger. That is called pseudoprogression. And at the time, you don't know what it is. The worst thing to do is to stop the drug. He didn't do that. He carried on and the following images showed him to be right. The tumor shrank. It shrank below the 50% rate at the time. We didn't know that. A little later, it was even smaller. And then it wasn't even visible anymore. We call that complete response. 
unconfirmed complete response at that time. But then when the next image happened and it was still not there, there was confirmed complete response. Unfortunately, there was an unfortunate thing happening as well. There was a grade three treatment emergent adverse event. Treatment emergent adverse events are de defined independent of causality. It, the term by itself doesn't say if it is related to the drug or not, but our investigator did think it was related to the drug. And in response, he dropped the dose by half. He was in a way right because the adverse event disappeared and the tumor didn't show in the next image. But in the following image, there was tumor tissue again visible. That is progression, because different from the first time, this came out of nothing. You can't argue this away. This is not pseudo progression. Many clinical trials would stop the treatment at this point in time. Our protocol was written differently. It was written such that it allowed treatment beyond progression. And our investigator did that. He did more than that. He discussed it with us, the sponsor, and we agreed he doubled the dose. That was in a way potentially risky if this was really related to the drug, then um, this could bring the adverse event back, but that didn't happen. What happened was patient did well, the tumor got smaller, not as fast as it was in the beginning. That is very typical for that situation, and, but then it started getting bigger again in the again, beginning. Again, we didn't know if that was real, but something else happened. A different type of adverse event happened. A side effect of the drug by the judgment of the investigator. He again thought this was related to the drug, but this time it was grade four, life threatening. He discontinued. The tumor continued to grow. Now, if you have three measurements that show growth, it's hard to ignore it. It's hard to say this is pseudo progression or something else. It probably is real. And he thought so as well and started a different drug. I can't tell you which one it was and it didn't work. The tumor kept growing, even seemed to grow faster. And shortly thereafter, the tumor was so big that the organism couldn't take it. The lady passed away. That is not a good story. This is what we want to not have. This is why we do cancer research. We have these things in the future not happen anymore. And for that, we need to have good endpoints, sharp definitions that we communicate with each other. And the sharpest and clearest of all is overall survival. It starts with starting the drug and it ends with the end of death. It is the only endpoint that actually deserves that name. It is the end, at least for the patient, and it is almost a point. The time of death is very rarely disputed. All the others typically neither deserve the word end nor point, but we still call them end point, and you'll see in a moment. Because it is so definitive, we consider this the gold standard, but it has its weakness. Just think about this. What would have happened if this drug had worked? The tumor could have gotten smaller, could have gotten, could have gone away. The lady could still be alive today. That would be absolutely fantastic. And we in our clinical trial would have thought, well, we gave a drug in a patient that had a growing tumor. Now she's alive. We did really well. So our drug caused cure. Not true. Not true. That is a weakness of the overall survival endpoint. There are other endpoints that cover that. Progression-free survival is one. Progression-free survival starts at the beginning of treatment or randomization and goes until either progression or death, whatever occurs first and death by any reason. There is another one that's very similar, time to progression. Um, the difference to progression-free survival is that time to progression may not end by a death by a different reason than the cancer. In time to progression, death by, let's say, car accident would have con be considered a sensor time point, not an event. And there are more. Disease-free survival, DFS, is sometimes used. It's not useful in our clinical trial, and it wasn't a part of our protocol because 
our patients didn't start being disease free. This is used in adjuvant treatment when cancers are resected first. The surgeon took care for it. You can't see it, and then you give a drug and want to prevent the the drug for the the cancer from coming back. That's called adjuvant treatment, and then disease free survival is meaningful. But it then actually means the same thing as progression free survival. So it's questionable. We didn't have it. Event-free survival can also be a synonymous meaning from progression-free survival, but sometimes not, because the term event, the E in the word, can also mean other events. And in our trial, it did. In our trial, we said an event in our definition is disease progression, death by any reason, or a severe adverse event. This one was a severe adverse event. So the event-free survival in our patient came from here to here only, six months. There is time to treatment failure. The FDA doesn't favor that. They favor event-free survival. In, and you can read that in the document. But in our trial, since treatment beyond progression was allowed, the treatment failure was this event. And the time to treatment failure would have been a year. And finally, there is duration of response. That is nowadays used very often, a killer of phase two studies. It ends also with progression, similar to PFS, TTP, TTP and disease-free survival, but it has a different starting point. The starting point of duration of response is the response. And therefore also, it only counts for patients that actually have a response. And that's the weakness of this measure. This measure actually is not relevant unless you know the response rate. Together with the response rate is it adds information. What have we covered today? We went over the time to event endpoints. Please remember OS, overall survival is the gold standard. It ends with death by any reason. PFS, EFS, TTP and T2F all end with progression. DOR has a different starting point. It starts with response. And I hope we will see you again with the next video. Bye-bye.